We aim to create a new leadership class for America, marked by courage, learning, friendship, patriotism, and vocational excellence. The desire to fight has got to come from a visceral love for your country, or else it will not seem worth any struggle against its corruption. What shall we do with this enormous inheritance, which is our birthright citizenship in history's greatest republic? I am Daniel McCarthy, uh, Editor-in-Chief of Modern Age, and uh, as Johnny mentioned, Vice President for the Collegiate Network at ISI. Modern Age is a quarterly magazine founded in 1957, and for the past six decades, it has been uh, a venue for some of the most important philosophical discussions on the right, including such debates as those between Harry Jaffa and M.E. Bradford over the place of equality in conservatism and the American regime, and ongoing arguments between traditionalist and libertarian branches of thought, as well as arguments between newer schools of thought on the right. So we are very happy to have you join us today for this uh, panel, which will be an instructive discussion on topics involving Machiavelli, Montesquieu, the American regime, manliness, and the future of education in our country. Let me introduce my former colleague, Samuel Goldman, who is executive director of the John L. Loeb Jr. Institute for Religious Freedom and the director of the Politics and Values Program at the George Washington University. He is the author of the recent book, After Nationalism, and until recently, he was the literary editor of Modern Age. Next to Professor Goldman is Professor Vicki Sullivan, who is the Cornelia M. Jackson Professor of Political Science at Tufts University. Her books include Machiavelli's Three Romes, Religion, Human Liberty, and Politics Reformed, and most recently, Montesquieu and the Despotic Ideas of Europe. Next to Professor Sullivan is Professor Harvey Mansfield, the William R. Kennan, Jr. Professor of Government at Harvard University. You'll be hearing much more about Professor Mansfield later tonight, but for now I will simply note that his books include Machiavelli's New Modes and Orders, Taming the Prince, Manliness, and A Student's Guide to Political Philosophy, which is published by ISI. Professor Mansfield has been kind enough to share with his fellow panelists a chapter in a forthcoming book he has written uh, about Montesquieu and Machiavelli. With that, I will turn to Sam Goldman to kick us off. Thanks, Dan, and thanks to all of you uh, for joining us. Um, <clears throat> the purpose of this panel, and indeed of this evening, uh, is to honor Professor Mansfield, uh, to adopt for a moment the subtle, perhaps elliptical style for which he is known. Uh, I want to start by noting that the invitation to participate in honoring someone worthy of honor is itself an honor. Uh, honors awarded by those who are themselves unworthy of honor, even in a small degree, uh, can't mean very much to the one who is to be honored for greater accomplishments. Uh, all of which is to say uh, that I am grateful to ISI for asking me to speak this afternoon, um, and I hope that my presence and words are appropriate to the occasion. So what are the achievements uh, that we are honoring? Uh, as you know, Professor Mansfield has been a leader in the somewhat dubious field of political science uh, for longer than many of us have been alive. Uh, as an intellectual historian, uh, he helped reconstruct Burke's thought, rescuing it from the disrepute into which the great old Whig's ideas had fallen. In doing so, Mansfield reminded readers that ideas matter even when they don't find their consequences immediately or obviously. As a translator and commentator, uh, Mansfield has opened the world of Machiavelli to careful readers in all its vividness, beauty, and sometimes horror. He has modestly written that, quote, every time I have been thrown upon an uninhabited island I thought might be unexplored, I have come across a small sign saying, please deposit coin. After I comply, a large sign flashes in neon lights that would have been visible from afar with this message, Leo Strauss was here. Now, even if that is true, uh, there is a difference between the first visitor to an undiscovered country and the cartographer who minutely describes it for the, those who follow. Uh, Columbus Day was observed earlier this week, 
And as Mansfield points out, uh, Machiavelli compares himself to Columbus and other great explorers of his heroic age. And contrary to his cultured despisers, we need Columbuses, uh, but we also need the Lewis and Clarks who supply the map for the territory. These are estimable works of scholarship uh, to which the translation and commentary on Tocqueville that Mansfield completed with his late wife, Delba Winthrop, must be added. Uh, but Mansfield has also distinguished himself as a thinker. In essays on the American political tradition, he's followed Tocqueville in insisting that written laws and institutions, uh, what Tocqueville called forms, matter even though they are not the only things that matter. The Constitution, on this account, is neither an expression of empty ideals, irrelevant to the hidden competition to secure material interests, that's supposedly what really matters, nor is it an impersonal mechanism generating predictable results without regard to the ambitions, beliefs, and characters of the citizen and statesmen who populate political life. Instead, the Constitution or constitutionalism is a kind of school that forms people who pursue their own goals under its authority. Constitutionalism is neither an expression of arbitrary power, perhaps concealed with fine words, nor a deductive exercise in human engineering. It's a particular kind of education that recognizes truths discovered by political philosophers who brave the dangers of the unknown and make them effectual for the rest of us. Above all, therefore, I think Mansfield's accomplishments lie in his work as a teacher to generations of students uh, at Harvard, as I, at ISI, and other institutions, as well as on the page. The style of Mansfield's teaching, it seems to me, owes something to Machiavelli. Like Machiavelli, he is not reluctant to provoke and even to shock, especially with audiences that are not inclined to pay close attention. Provocation is sometimes the best way to get them to listen. Also like Machiavelli, though, Mansfield is not reluctant to be enigmatic and perhaps even intentionally mysterious. Uh, if the vulgar, as Machiavelli calls them, can be brought to brief attention by means of scandal, contradictions, paradoxes, and riddles can help sustain the interest of those more inclined to reflection. Mere spectators may be attracted by the promise of fireworks, but it's the superficially easy question, the dropped hint, or the subtle emphasis that attracts repeat customers and cultivates junior partners in the constitutional enterprise. Again, like Machiavelli, finally, uh, Mansfield always presents himself uh, both to the philosophers he reveres and to the audience he instructs um, in his courtly and regal garments. And I admit that I've always tried to emulate that <laughs> aspect of his approach, even when the others elude me. Um, this is not just an old-fashioned, um, but also a distinctively manly style of teaching. The courage to face objection, even denunciation, confidence in one's own authority, and the use of serious manners for a serious enterprise are all a stark contrast to the deferential, chummy, informal style uh, that dominates academia. In politics, I... I I think I'm uh, speaking fairly when I say that Mansfield is, like the rest of us um, in this democratic country and era, to some extent a Democrat, with a small d, needless to say. Uh, but his classroom is not a democracy, and he knows that the practice of liberal education is not egalitarian. How could it be, after all, when the purpose is to distinguish truth from opinion, beautiful from ugly, and worthy from unworthy. So it's fitting then that Mansfield's virtues are particularly evident in his investigations of manliness. Uh, it's now recently fashionable 
to speak of a crisis of men and boys and to wonder whether the quest for a gender neutral society, however understandable in its original motives, has mutated into an orthodoxy as stifling and hostile to human experience as the ostensible patriarchy that it has so effectively overthrown. But almost 20 years ago, when uh, Mansfield published Manliness, that was very far from the case. Um, at that time, the defense of manliness, which he describes as courage in the face of risk, was itself a challenge to the conventional wisdom that earned the usual reward of such bravery, uh, incomprehension, dismissal, and denunciation. Uh, if the book were republished today, as I think it deserves to be, uh, I, I wonder whether this, the response might be very different. But the message of the book was not what many of the critics, and I think even some of the admirers, believed. Rather than making the case that the raw power of manliness must be unleashed in defiance of a feminized age, Mansfield argues that manliness is simultaneously necessary and dangerous, something that we can't live with in perfect comfort, but that we also cannot do without. Uh, the goal is to recognize manliness as valuable and indelible, but also in doing so, to rescue it from the exaggerated expressions to which men are inclined when ignored or dishonored. And I think we are still struggling to meet that challenge. Unfamiliar as that subtle assessment of manliness uh, was to the public, um, several of its aspects were already known, or at least prefigured, to Mansfield's students from his studies of executive power, uh, which is the most manly element of a divided government. Uh, modern philosophers and statesmen, very much including the framers of the Constitution, could not ignore Machiavelli's exposure of the unseemly methods that are often required to get and hold on to power. On the other hand, they couldn't fully endorse them, recognizing the dangers of violence severed from moral and institutional restraint. One of the principal tasks for those who sought to establish a distinctively modern regime then was to tame the prince, channeling the ambition and energy of one man seeking to acquire or maintain his state toward the general security, general security and liberty uh, rather than accepting or even embracing the possibility of tyranny. And I think Professor Sullivan will take up um, some of those themes in her remarks. Uh, for my part, I, I want to conclude uh, with the observation that Professor Mansfield's way of teaching is not for everyone. Uh, the thin-skinned, the impatient, and the conceited do not respond favorably to these methods. And here I speak from experience, <laughs> because when I first encountered Professor Mansfield, almost exactly 20 years ago, as it happens, uh, I was far too immature, both personally and intellectually, uh, to recognize the riches that he set before me. Like certain readers of Machiavelli, with whom he has waged scholarly battles over the years, uh, I thought that the past, however majestic, uh, offered few lessons to the present. And apparently self-assured, I was also too insecure in my own ideas to submit to the judgment of a teacher certain to see their superficiality and ignorance. I can't claim to have overcome these defects entirely. Uh, but I am now older and I hope a little bit wiser. Uh, and the result is not uh, any uh, new confidence that I'm in any sense Mansfield's peer. On the contrary, it's, it's a deeper appreciation um, for the extraordinary achievements and career that we are honoring today. So in the long run, I think I have learned one of the essential uh, and still unpopular lessons uh, that Professor Mansfield has worked for so many decades to impart. And that's that the, the indicator, the reflection of genuine understanding is not necessarily innovation um, as modern culture and especially the modern academy insist. 
Uh, instead, it is respect, even reverence, for the accomplishments of the explorers, the founders, and the teachers who have preceded us. And I ask uh, Dan's indulgence here because I've offered some personal comments as well as, as general ones, but I didn't have another opportunity to say these things, so I've chosen to offer them to you now. Wonderful. Uh, Professor Sullivan. Thank you very much. It is a privilege indeed to be here with uh, Sam Goodman to honor um, Professor Harvey Mansfield. Thank you to ISI um, for the opportunity. It has been both my bad fortune and my good fortune to happen to write on two authors whom uh, Professor Mansfield has explored in great depth, Machiavelli and Montesquieu. Um, of course, Professor Mansfield has examined other readers, uh, other writers in depth as well. I, um, not so much. So first, the bad fortune. It can be utterly immobilizing to try to add something to the scholarship in Professor Mansfield's wake. Um, he completely dominates the study of, of Machiavelli and Montesquieu. And during a particular period, um, when I was preparing to write a dissertation on Machiavelli's discourses on Livy, my daily regimen was to read 30 pages of Machiavelli's Italian and then turn to the corresponding commentary in Professor Mansfield's New Modes and Orders. Um, I am not a gifted student of the languages, but I think I did better with the former task of reading the Italian than coming to, the, to grips with um, Professor Mansfield's commentary. Um, so the, the issue um, for anyone writing on, on Machiavelli and, and Montesquieu is how to come to terms with both the philosopher and the commentator. It's an intimidating fast, fat task. Um, and again, how to say anything that has not been said. And I think Professor Mansfield actually facilitates both tasks. Um, and I think that is actually my great good fortune in, in following in Professor Mansfield's wake. Um, as Sam indicated, a, a thinker and a commentator of the magnitude of, of Professor Mansfield is a cartographer who opens up uh, vast vistas. Um, but there's something more um, in addition. Um, Professor Mansfield has a great generosity of spirit, and I mean that in a Montesquieuian sense, um, which I hope will become clearer later on um, as my comments uh, continue. Uh, I'll give you an example. I was, um, I was a student of Mansfield on the page, um, never, never in person. Um, and I had recently published my first article on Machiavelli. I was a new assistant professor, and I arrived at my college mailroom and looked through the glass door of my mailbox, and inside I saw a letter with the Harvard seal and in elegant handwriting, H. Mansfield. And for a newly minted PhD, that was an astounding moment. Um, and it was a commentary on the article I had just published. Um, he was very generous um, and said that, that he liked the article, um, but he wanted more, which could also be uh, very in intimidating. Um, so there is a great uh, generosity of spirit, because Professor Mansfield, in his scholarship, makes room for others. Um, and I, I do want to turn to uh, Professor Mansfield and his recent work on Montesquieu and Machiavelli. Uh, we were given 
a chapter um, from Professor Mansfield's recent book um, that's uh, forthcoming from Cambridge University <laughs> Press on uh, Machiavelli and the effectual truth. Um, one aspect of Professor Mansfield's uh, treatment of both Machiavelli and Montesquieu is that these philosophers see the power of the written word. They see how philosophy can rule over minds and by ruling over minds can rule human behavior. And I think uh, Montesquieu really gives the game away in um, book 29, chapter 19, in a chapter, a very short chapter called On Legislators. And if you're a story, uh, if, you're a, if you're a student of, of history, you would automatically think of Numa, Lycurgus, Solon, Theseus, and you'd be wrong. Because the only names whom Montesquieu offers in this chapter are philosophers, namely Plato, Aristotle, Machiavelli, Moore, and Harrington. And there, Montesquieu indicates that the ultimate ruler are the philosophers because they educate both rulers and ruled alike. Um, and when Montesquieu refers to these prior philosophers as legislators, you have to consider the possibility that he's thinking also of himself and what his effect will be on future politics. And Montesquieu himself in the preface to the Spear of the Laws says that he's looked at the great mosaic that the European thinkers, the European philosophers have painted. And he says, I too, I have not lost spirit. I too am a painter. Um, and I would like, perhaps not in my immediate comments, but perhaps later this afternoon, um, address the profound impact that Montesquieu has had on our world. Um, and Montesquieu, um, in the preface, says something very vague. Um, it's introduced without context in a short paragraph set off by itself. He says this, one feels the old abuses and sees their correction. But one also sees the abuses of the correction itself. You have to read the entire work, I think come to a deeper understanding of the entire work to, to see what he's talking about. But what Professor Mansfield has shown with respect to Montesquieu is that to a large extent, Montesquieu is responding to Machiavelli. That Montesquieu sees the abuses that modernity, early modernity, particularly Machiavelli, was responding to. Sees the correction, but also sees the abuses of the correction. Later on, um, in a later book, book six of the Spear of the Laws, Montesquieu uses the same language of abuses and correction. And I think he's more forthright there. He says this, a legislator who wants to correct an ill often thinks only of that correction. His eye is on the object and not its defects. Once the ill has been corrected, only the harshness of the legislator is seen. But a vice produced by the harshness remains in the state. Spirits are corrupted. They have become accustomed to despotism. And um, 
I believe that what uh, Montesquieu is doing here is really referring to Machiavelli as a legislator, that he was too harsh, and that a result of his actions, um, our spirits, Montesquieu uses this term elsewhere, our spirits have become atrocious. Um, and he says that, that spirits become accustomed to despotism. And what Professor Mansfield does in this chapter is really quite astounding. He looks at every book, every book, every the 31 books of the spirit of the laws and sees how Machiavelli is an unnamed presence um, in those books. And um, just briefly, I, I want to talk about something that, that Professor Mansfield doesn't emphasize, um, but I think it's worth emphasizing with respect to, to um, Montesquieu. When Montesquieu talks about the legislator and a legislator's correction having abuses, that's in book six, which is Montesquieu's first of two books on the importance of criminal judgment and criminal punishments. And what Montesquieu says about this, I think, um, cannot be overemphasized. He says, the knowledge already acquired in some countries and yet to be acquired in others concerning the surest rules one can observe in criminal punishments is of more concern to mankind than anything else in the world. For Montesquieu to come out and to say that this is the most important knowledge um, is extremely important, and it's overlooked, I think, um, in a lot of the literature. Um, a lot of scholars of, of Montesquieu think that he's a relativist, he's an observer, and that he doesn't make judgments. Um, but here, he's telling you what he thinks the most important knowledge is simply. And he doesn't say it's political knowledge, he says it's knowledge. It's knowledge simply, it's the most important knowledge. Um, and, um, in my own way, I'd like to, to vindicate or to show in another way Professor Mansfield's understanding that Machiavelli is behind so much of what Montesquieu writes in the spirit of the laws. Um, in, in one passage, um, in, in Early in, in The Spirit of the Laws, Montesquieu um, responds in two different ways to Machiavelli without ever naming him. Um, I will quote Montesquieu. Um, After St. Bartholomew's Day, that is the massacre in the 16th century, when Charles IX had set orders to all the governors to have the Huguenots massacred, the Vicomte of Ault, who was in command at Bayonne, wrote the king. And at that point, Montesquieu provides a direct quote from a work of a Huguenot by the name of Agrippa d'Aubigné, who wrote the universal history. And it's, so it's a direct quote, and Montesquieu provides the, 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 the footnote. And this is what, um, the Vicomte d'Ort says, and Machiavelli quotes, Sir, I have found among the inhabitants and the warriors only good citizens, brave soldiers, and not one executioner. Thus, they and I beg your majesty to use our arms and our lives for things that can be done. So here we have a nobleman standing up to the king when the king is, is ordering, essentially, a massacre. And Montesquieu says this in response. 
the nobleman displayed great and generous courage, which regarded a, co a cowardly act as an impossible thing. So please keep in mind those two terms, generous um, and great. Um, I think um, Montesquieu takes those terms from Machiavelli and actually is referring in two different ways to Machiavelli's thought there and attempting to repudiate them or to overturn them. The first way is um, Daubigny uh, uh, was a Huguenot author. He was a Huguenot poet, a Huguenot soldier, and in his universal um, history, which we can assume Montesquieu read, he decries the French monarchy for their Machiavellianism. So Machiavelli is behind that story in that way. Um, but in another way, um, Machiavelli, in two very bold, um, aggressive ways, uses those very terms, great and generous. One, and they are in two different places in the discourses, book one, chapter 27, book three, chapter 27. Um, in book three, chapter 27, uh, Machiavelli is describing what needs to be done when a prince or a ruler is confronting a divided city. And he says that you should take the most aggressive um, actions possible. And to, to refer to Professor Mansfield's earlier book, um, Taming the Prince, where he also deals with the relationship between Machiavelli and Montesquieu. Um, Machiavelli says, you need to have an execution. You need to act. You need to carry things out. But he quite literally means um, you need to have um, a, a, a literal execution. And this is what Machiavelli says in chapter 327. Because such executions have in them something of the great and the generous, those are the words, a weak republic does not know how to do them and is so distant from them that it is led to another remedy only with trouble. Machiavelli here is being very provocative. He is, in a way, transvaluating the terms great and generous. And I think what, what Machiavelli is, is claiming is that if you take strong measures, the strongest possible me measures, you will be doing a great service. It will be generous in that um, these factions have, have been disrupting the, the common life of, of your city, and um, it can be ended very quickly, and, and therefore you benefit the others. The other place um, that Machiavelli uses these terms, great and generous, again, it's in this um, transgressive sort of way, as I indicated, is, is chapter 27 of book one. And he applies them with reference to a notorious criminal, specific Baglioni. And um, Baglioni, he's, Machiavelli says, was incestuous with um, his sister and had killed his nephews and cousins to rule. Baglioni, for Machiavelli, had great promise, but he failed. He failed because when the pope and the cardinals, with which Machiavelli says had all their delicious things, entered his city to depose him, he capitulated. He did not create um, a very, the crime that would have solidified his rule. Um, and Machiavelli condemns Baglioni for this with this statement. When greatness, when malice has greatness in itself or is generous in some part, human beings do not know how to enter into it. Machiavelli laments. 
So I think what, what, what is going on here is Machiavelli is, is rendering these terms, extricating them um, from common morality, is giving us a different meaning for generosity and greatness. And Montesquieu is trying to revert, to correct the abuses of Machiavelli. He is applying the terms greatness and generosity to actions of moderation, gentleness, and humanity. Um, and so in these ways, I, I want to corroborate um, what Professor, not that he needs it, but what Professor Mansfield has indicated in this chapter. At one point in this chapter, um, Professor Mansfield says, Montesquieu attempts to relieve and reassure. Um, so, um, again, um, just in conclusion, um, I want to point to Professor Mansfield's great and generous spirit, but very much in a Machiavellian spirit, um, as he has opened up um, the field of political philosophy, modern political philosophy, for scholars like me and others. And again, he has a great generosity of spirit. Bravo. Let us turn to Professor Mansfield himself for some responses to these remarks. Well, um, um, if I'm not overwhelmed, I'm whelmed. <laughs> you, you say that. And I'm, now, how are we going to uh, proceed? I, was, I thought maybe I would um, begin with a few remarks on, on, on what each oh, please do. Uh, respondent had said, and then stop and uh, look for response from them. Or maybe from the audience, something like that. Sure, we will uh, begin uh, because, with some... Because uh, otherwise, it, uh, I, I'm not up to a two-hour lecture. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> Nor is anyone else. <laughs> All right. Um, <laughs> um, well, uh, Sam Goodman, I, I, I heard what you said at the end, and I thanks, thank you very much for those words. And, and um, he's... Uh, Harvard PhD, former student, and uh, a kind of prodigal son, we'll put it that way. <laughs> and and uh, Vicki Sullivan, uh, she didn't get her PhD at Harvard, she got it at uh, Chicago, but she has an advantage, uh, <laughs> which she didn't mention, but uh, everybody can see, and that's, uh, well, that I have a kind of eye, if you just look at my wife over here, for uh, good-looking blondes. <laughs> <laughs> and that's, yeah, and that was my attraction to, um, no small part of my attraction to Vicky. So, and, and still is. Um, all right, uh, let me start with uh, Leo Strauss, who was uh, not a Harvard professor, but a professor at the University of Chicago, who got my attention uh, when I, entered uh, graduate school, which was at Harvard and not at Chicago. And I came to know him and um, um, got to see him uh, for one year when he was out at Palo Alto and I was uh, teaching at my first job at the University of California. And um, let, me just, uh, let me just remark on uh, a couple of things from Leo Strauss which um, don't really have to do with what he taught or aren't what, exactly the main theses of his, of his uh, teaching. And one was, uh, he liked to say that if you were a professor going into a classroom, you should uh, behave and consider yourself say, in a situation in which one of the people, the students you are addressing, far exceeds you in mind and heart. This is uh, an example of inequality in the classroom. <laughs> um, but it, uh, but it, it, it means that the, the professor 
shouldn't take his inequality or his, his superiority for granted. And, and that means uh, watch out for what you're saying. <laughs> it could be wrong. So, um, so that's a little bit about democracy with a small d and teaching in the classroom. And um, another thing that he did was simply to call himself a professor and not a philosopher. He, as a philosopher, I think, made himself uh, more as a more modest situation as a professor because, listen, uh, professors are not on the level of these authors that we are talking about, Machiavelli and Montesquieu and others, these authors of the great books. So, um, so, so Strauss had this kind of modesty not to introduce himself as a new philosopher, but rather to get people to read the ancient philosophers especially. And um, to do that, you had to read them. And there are not too many of them, and although there are many commentators on them, but um, you need to try to grasp the principles of their thinking from them in the way that they saw them. And so, as he often said, uh, you need to read an author as he presents himself, as he would like to, read, like to be read, and not from a superior attitude that you know more because you're more modern and live later than he did. So the great books. So, um, the great books have a certain status, I think. Um, most people uh, watch TV, uh, read the uh, internet, used to read newspapers. If uh, you want to get a little bit more than what you can get from TV, and if you want to get a little bit more than that, you can read uh, magazines and journals like Modern Age. And if you want still more than that, you can read books. And if you want more than that, you need to read the great books. The great books are what the greatest minds in humanity have left for our amusement and our instruction. So you should not go through college <laughs> or after college without looking at them and drawing inspiration from them. They will stay with you. They will cultivate your mind. Your mind is cultivated when you're in the presence and trying to understand someone who knows more than you do. That's how you learn. So I think that the great books are the sort of trickles down from the mountaintops that turn into streams and rivers and oceans. They are responsible for the ideas that human beings have. The things that we think are innovative and new and uh, striking and unheard of, <laughs> you can find in them, if you look, they sometimes slightly covered up because uh, they had to be prudent. Thinking is subversive because uh, when you think, you challenge the most precious things that you have in your own life or your own society. Those are the unquestioned things that you take for granted. Um, the great, great books are the answer, the remedy for the disease of taking things for granted. So, um, and therefore, though I'm a conservative, <laughs> I think that conservatives should nourish themselves with the great books. Uh, a few years ago, fairly recently, Arizona State University um, decided 
to give conservatives a little more recognition in, the, in that university than uh, they had had before. They'd been uh, prompted by the legislature <laughs> who passed a grant of money for, um, for them. As a, Arizona State is a state university, which means that it gets about 15% of its money from the state. This, by the way, is a fact about state universities. They often don't take all that much money from the state. But um, they, so they, they picked that up and uh, came to me and asked whether I could suggest a kind of program. And the first thing that came to mind was, uh, don't uh, speak of conservatism, but speak of the great books. We conservatives can stand argument. We don't mind uh, hearing the other side. And besides, uh, you won't uh, attract such uh, uh, unwanted attention from the other side <laughs> if you don't call yourself conservative, at least in a university. So that's my view of the relationship between conservatism and the great books. So um, let me stop uh, right here for a moment and see what others might want to say. Um, yeah, I might uh, take a few cues from some of the early remarks that Professor Goldman and Professor Sullivan made and from these very eloquent remarks about the great books to um, posit to you a few uh, thoughts about uh, two of these, uh, the authors of great books, Machiavelli and Montesquieu, and their relationship to uh, conservatism, to America, and to some of the controversies uh, that we are facing at present. And uh, Professor uh, Mansfield has alluded very eloquently and very elegantly to uh, the importance of Leo Strauss as a thinker. And by the way, I think I should emphasize for the audience that um, you know, Harvey Mansfield was a student at Harvard University. He was not studying directly under Leo Strauss. Uh, Professor Sullivan was uh, a reader of Harvey Mansfield. She was not a direct student of his. And yet the books by Leo Strauss, by Harvey Mansfield, they stood in for the experience of having that direct personal teaching. And while that's not a substitute, it does nonetheless allow the conveyance of great ideas through the medium of the text. And of course, as Plato tells us, there are many difficulties with conveying ideas through text, but uh, it does work. And I think we see uh, the results of that here. But let me uh, begin by, by asking this question. Leo Strauss suggests uh, that Machiavelli is in many senses the founder of modernity. And uh, we see the influence of Machiavelli's ideas flowing through even a thinker like Montesquieu, who in many respects is quite different from Machiavelli. That Machiavelli is uh, often identified with virtu, with this very, you know, sort of in some ways savage or cruel kind of manliness, this very um, hubristic or domineering kind of manliness. Uh, whereas Montesquieu, on the other hand, is often seen as being uh, the philosopher of commerce and of sweetness and softening. <laughs> And America owes a great debt to Montesquieu. Montesquieu was the uh, philosopher that the founding fathers cited, I think, the most uh, during the revolutionary period and perhaps during the uh, framing of the Constitution as well. So America is, in some senses, a, a country that owes a great debt to Montesquieu. But through Montesquieu, does it also owe a debt to Machiavelli? And Leo Strauss says that America is an unusual country and that in its founding, it was actually uh, explicitly against the kind of Machiavellian ideas of power and of you know, sort of force and fraud. Um, is this true? Are we, are we a, a anti-Machiavellian country? Or because of our debt to, to Montesquieu, is there a sense in which we must be partly Machiavellian, even as we also perhaps reject some of his ideas as well? Perhaps I'll turn to Sam Goldman for some initial thoughts. Yeah, I mean, it, 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 it seems to me, um, as Professor Selden has described, that what Montesquieu, among others, is trying to do is to moderate Machiavelli and to moderate modernity. Um, he, he doesn't want to reject these things, and I think he, he, he can't reject them altogether. Um, but he recognizes risks or dangers in which Machiavelli seems to have reveled, uh, even though they're quite horrifying to um, to, to many of us. So I think the, the challenge 
for the framers of, of the Constitution following, um, following Montesquieu is how to learn from elements of Machiavelli without adopting the whole, the whole package. And, and, and as I mentioned, and I'm just echoing Professor Mansfield, I mean, that, that seems particularly clear um, in the treatment of executive power, you know, this, this, this institutional function that doesn't really exist in the same way in, in pre-modern thought, although obviously there are, there are prefigurations, um, and which seems to the framers, um, and also I, I think to, to Locke, who doesn't say what people expect about this, um, to be absolutely necessary, but also to pose a great, to pose a great danger. Um, so there's an element of anti-Machiavellianism, um, but in order, but, it, but one can oppose Machiavellianism while learning from Machiavelli, I think, if that, if that is not entirely incoherent. <laughs> Absolutely. If I could follow up on that, I, I, I think that was actually not incoherent, but very well said. Um, when I think when when Montesquieu says that he sees the abuses, actually I think feels the abuses um, and sees the correction. I I, I think um, that that Montesquieu is saying, agreeing with with Machiavelli, we needed a break. Um, from both the classical tradition um, and the Christian tradition. And, um, and my reading of Montesquieu is that, that he saw very much the despotism that was endemic in those traditions. Um, but he is always, Montesquieu is always, I think, trying to soften us. Um, and um, Dan, you mentioned commerce, and obviously, um, first England and then the United States are, are regimes founded on commerce, and to a large extent, we owe um, the, the analysis of the importance of commerce to Montesquieu. But commerce in Montesquieu's French means a lot more. Um, it means social commerce. It actually means sexual commerce. Um, and um, that comes out when he's talking about the, 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 the sort of softer, much more enjoyable life that the French have um, because they have a joie de vivre. And, and Montesquieu would not write that, that, that off. Um, on the other hand, and another issue um, that, that Professor Mansfield's chapter brings up and merely alludes to um, is sort of the competition um, between Locke and Montesquieu as sort of the, the thinker or the philosopher of liberalism. And, and Professor Mansfield points out that, that Montesquieu never mentions Locke. <laughs> in the spirit of the laws. Um, but one thing that, that my study of Montesquieu has brought to me um, is the extent to which Montesquieu really is the legislator of the modern world. Um, the modern world as we live it in the United States um, and elsewhere, um, in, in Western Europe. Let me just give you uh, just a couple of examples. Everyone knows in the Federalist Papers, Publius says that Montesquieu is the oracle of the separation of powers. Um, but he was used on both sides of the debate over the Constitution. The Anti-Federalists invoked Montesquieu um, for the need to have small republics. And then Publius rejoins with, um, by citing Montesquieu and saying, but you can have a federal republic. There's a famous article in the American Political Science Review going way back, uh, 1990s, um, by Don Lutz, um, analyzing 
the, the literature that was in um, the American libraries at the time, and he has a chart, and uh, he says Montesquieu dominated every period of the founding, not just the Declaration of Independence, but the Constitution making. So he dominates. But what even um, underscores that domination is that the second writer is Blackstone, the English jurist. And Blackstone was explicitly the student of Montesquieu. He cites him repeatedly. So Montesquieu dominates um, the American founding period, um, even more so than Locke. And Lutz finds Locke, obviously, very important um, during the period of um, the Declaration of, of Independence. Um, but there are other ways as well. Um, as I, my remarks pointed out, Montesquieu says the most important knowledge is the correct way to proceed in criminal judgments. And his student, uh, Cesare Beccaria, um, was a, a major proponent of criminal justice, made all sorts of, of, of recommendations that were ultimately embraced. And he says explicitly in his work on crime and punishment, I follow in the footsteps of the great Montesquieu. But even beyond that, um, the great writer of the encyclopedia is Louis de Jocot. Uh, he wrote an incredible number of the articles of D'Alembert and Diderot's encyclopedia, and he is an acolyte of, of Montesquieu. And he cites him explicitly, for example, um, in the, his article on slavery. Montesquieu clearly is against slavery in all sorts of ways. He wants us to, to feel sympathy. Um, he wants to cultivate our sympathetic passions for, for slaves, um, even among the Greeks and the, and, and the Romans. But Jocor takes that article, cites it explicitly, um, and makes Montesquieu much more pointed. And I think an article, the great books are not merely conservative. They, they, they foment change. Um, and I think Montesquieu's tactic of not taking on um, injustices directly, but rather indirectly, um, using sarcasm and satire was picked up. And the, the leading lights of um, the anti-slavery movement in England were students of Jocor and behind Jocor of Montesquieu. Um, and um, I think more work needs to be done, uh, the extent to which uh, Montesquieu's thought was promulgated by the encyclopedia. So in a way, uh, you know, when we talk about commerce, when we talk about trade, we're talking about, uh, about Montesquieu. And I don't think we, in a way, he's almost, his thought is almost like um, the air that we breathe and we don't notice it. Um, but he wanted, he thought he was a legislator and indeed I think he was in fact a legislator. Yeah, well, uh, thanks. There's some erudition for you. So, um, yeah, I, I could say a little bit more about um, Machiavelli as uh, um, an author who had great influence on our lives, or on America, and um, and it comes through Montesquieu. So, as Vicky Sullivan said, uh, he is the one who specialized. Um, in the notion of the separation of powers as the main feature of a, of a constitution. Others, including Locke, had uh, come before him, but he's the one who, who, uh, who made it the, the essence of constitutionalism. And it goes together with a, another principle, which uh, you hear all the time, checks and balances, that uh, there, no, there should be no power in government which is not checked by another power. And that's because uh, power will often, or at least if it's carried to its extreme, go wrong. 
So power is something that we need, but also something that we need to suspect. And um, now how does that comport with uh, Machiavelli? Montesquieu made the remark, we begin to be cured of Machiavellism. He didn't say we begin to be cured of Machiavelli, but of Machiavellism. Machiavellism is the reputation of Machiavelli. <clears throat> and the reputation that he has yeah. is of one who resorts to and even instructs you how to commit dirty tricks. So, dirty tricks. Now, in Machiavelli, he gives this reasoning for that. This is from uh, chapter 15 of The Prince. He says, uh, if you try to be good, among many who are not good, you will come to grief. And the people who deny this and who think that it is possible to do good are required to give a picture of a good society in their imaginations. So those who do good and think it's sufficient to do good and never evil yeah. have to resort to an imaginary kingdom or republic in which this is possible. And uh, Machiavelli says, it isn't possible. And la bontà non basta. Goodness is not enough. So, um, therefore, one has to look at the way things are as opposed to the way they ought to be. And the way things are, you um, have to take measures and use your foresight and your anticipation and do what the other fellow is about to do to you before he does it. <clears throat> now, that other fellow might have been good, but you anticipated that he would be evil. That's because um, you, the, the, the anticipation that he will do, he will do evil say, is uh, more reliable say, than the one that he'll do you good. So, here you are in a situation in which you are not so strong as somebody else. How are you going to behave to him? You are weak. Well, if you are weak, you can either become strong by strengthening yourself and taking him on directly and hoping to win, or by using indirect means, or fraud. Machiavelli likes that word fraud, to get around the strong. And it seems that if you're weak, there's no way you can become strong against the strong, except by fooling them, or committing some kind of fraud. And that's why fighting, or dirty tricks, is necessary to fighting. We've got two boxers in a ring, they're pretty equal. They can have a fair fight. But that isn't the usual situation, not in society, not in politics. So you have to fight using fraud in such a way that though you use other people, you never depend on them for sure and for good. So all of your friends, um, they are not surely your friends. They may turn against you. So you must watch out for that. The value in friendship is to build up a relationship to the point where it becomes valuable for you to betray it. So, a statement of rational behavior, if you like, is it's necessary to become one alone, uno solo, 
one alone, all by yourself. And this is the principle that Mortiska took up against. And he, uh, instead of speaking Italian, he speaks French. <laughs> and he says uh, that phrase, un seul, is the very definition of despotism. But he didn't want to do away with um, the power of one alone. He just wanted to check it and check it with somebody else, maybe, who also had a power that um, could, uh, be, could be used against the first one. So the principle of one alone works by competition. And competition is in Machiavelli as much as in Montesquieu. Montesquieu emphasizes say, his, um, his uh, distrust of one alone, whereas Machiavelli emphasizes his reliance on that. But Machiavelli knew that there will be others who come up and who use fraud against you. So that no human society or institution could be permanent. The only one that could be permanent is one built on his principles. One Machiavellian society might well overtake another. But that, <laughs> does, that doesn't mean that it becomes any less Machiavellian. And it turns out, indeed, that Machiavelli himself has an imagination, and he has an imaginary republic of all republics in the globe, competing with each other, but all of them living by his instruction, so that he himself is the only ultimate, final, uno solo, over everyone. And how does this come to us? Well, Machiavelli had another principle that he also spoke of in that same chapter 15 of The Prince. And that was the phrase, the effectual truth. So this is my next book on Machiavelli, which will be out soon. Uh, from Cambridge Press, and it's called Machiavelli's Effectual Truth. And he said that you must look to the effectual truth of the thing rather than the imagination of it. So this, you could say, is the intellectual side of the moral argument, which I just gave you. The, the intellectual side, verità effettuale. He invented that word in Italian. Effettuale. You don't find it in any other Italian writer, <laughs> in the biggest dictionary of Italian that there is. Um, nor do you find it in any um, philosopher of the Middle Ages or any other philosopher. I've been saying this for about a decade and nobody's contradicted me yet. <laughs> so I'm waiting for that to happen. So I think um, this is a phrase which Machiavelli invented, effectual truth, effect. You judge a thing by the effect of it rather than the intent of it, by the consequence or by the behavior that results. So, for example, you judge a professor by what his students say, not so much by what he says. Uh, mm -hmm. This is uh, contrary to the teaching of Leo Strauss. <laughs> um, and so, um, but um, Mordisca seems to be a kind of um, student of, of Machiavelli because he also shows the effectual truth. Well, let me add that effectual truth, effect, comes from facere Latin, to make or to do, and it is related to the word fact, 
fact, effect and fact, factum. And in Latin, facti means uh, deeds, human deeds. Whereas we today use the word fact much more generally. This is a fact that this is a, a bottle, this is a table, that's a fact. We use it in this way. Did you know that the word fact was invented? He, not by Machiavelli, he didn't use that word, but he, uh, he taught the people who did use it. And it did start to use the word fact, and one of them was Thomas Hobbes in the next century, also a political philosopher, also looking for facts. So this word, which we use every single day, was invented, or so the, the basis of it was invented, by Machiavelli in his effectual truth. And people say that Machiavelli was not the beginning of modernity because modernity means science, modern science. Modern science, though, looks for a certain kind of cause, the kind of cause that has an effect and that therefore comes before an effect. And modern science says this is the only kind of cause that there is. So I think that this too comes from Machiavelli. Modern science first became um, evident in um, the century after Machiavelli. I said Machiavelli, um, the uh, 16th century, died in 1527, and Galileo, sort of the end of that and the 17th century, the beginning, the Royal Society, all the beginnings of modern science. Modern science is based on the effectual truth, that you don't judge by their things by their purpose, but by the way they go, the way they move. So Aristotle's metaph uh, physics and metaphysics, which include the purpose of things and the form of things, is <coughs> So that, um, is denied and is uh, uh, reconstructed by modern science in terms of one single cause, the effective cause, that, as, Aristotle, as Aristotle called it. So this is the effectual truth. And that you see in many people after Machiavelli and uh, especially in, in Montesquieu. So Montesquieu says, disagreeing with Machiavelli, that we don't need these dirty tricks and we don't need these shocking, um, shocking moves of authority, or coup, say, coup, coup d'autorité. So it's striking uh, things of, of, uh, that show your authority. Example, uh, when Reagan fired all the air controllers, I think. Or when anybody gets fired. Um, we've got a former president who likes to fire people. So, so that's, that's Machiavelli. People walk ever so much more carefully on eggshells after a public firing of that. He reminds them of who's who, what's what, and where you are. Yeah. So that's the kind of effectual truth that Machiavelli recommends, but Montesquieu uh, relies much more on a, a concept of interest or self-interest, which became powerful in the 18th century in the works of Adam Smith, above all. And so in self-interest, you trade with somebody, you negotiate, and um, you don't have to fight him to get what you want. You can get a little bit of what you want, and he get a, can get a little bit of what he wants. And you make a bargain. And this bargain is in the interest of both parties. So each party is against the other party. It's one thing to sell and another thing to buy. But since everyone knows that that is the case, and 
You don't, if you're selling and, and the buyer wants a lower price, you don't get angry because you know it's in his interest. You understand him. You've been a buyer yourself. So, so you understand both sides and you're willing to settle. And that's commerce. Instead of fighting, or instead of these rude expressions of authority. And commerce is peaceful, brings peace. And so this is what uh, uh, Montesquieu took from Machiavelli, but then used to moderate him, to soften him, and to tame him. So that's a little bit of how Montesquieu comes to America and Machiavelli too. The effectual truth looks to the outcome, the results of things, and Montesquieu looked at the effectual truth that Machiavelli had accomplished, which was an era of Machiavellianism, an era of absolute monarchies, conflicts, and Montesquieu tried to correct the excesses of Machiavelli's uh, innovations. Have we, however, gone too far in the opposite direction today, where uh, Montesquieu and the spirit of commerce have now led to such a softening that uh, manliness itself may be in danger of extinction? And certainly there are many on the American right today who look at Montesquieu, they look at the US Constitution, and they say that from the beginning these things were flawed because uh, they were going to lack, uh, well, a devotion to one alone by which they mean God, but which could mean any number of other things as well, including a sort of sense of captaincy or military prowess, which may also be dwindling, a sense of excellence that may also be dwindling in our society. That's a rather broad question, but let me throw it to Professor Goldman and see what responses he may have. Well, I mean, I, I think your, your description is, is certainly accurate. I mean, there's a dissatisfaction with moderation and even the idea of, of constitutionalism um, because it's not manly or, or self-expressive, self-assertive, self-assertive um, self enough. I mean, I, I think, as I suggested um, in my comments at, at the beginning, this is, this is a problem that Professor Mansfield has helped to diagnose. Um, the, the demand for risk and recognition um, that seems to be characteristically manly never really goes away. So if it doesn't find um, safe and, and honorable outlets, it will go somewhere else um, and take um, Take more dangerous, uh, more dangerous expression, and and that and that I think is just another way of restating the dilemma that Montesquieu faced, which is moderating or balancing these principles rather than rejecting one um, in favor in favor of the other. I mean, it's, it 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 strikes me that um, commerce is interesting because. Attitude, there, there, are, there are different attitudes toward commerce that are probably both always with us, but they, they shift in and out of favor. And sometimes commerce is seen um, as this buccaneering, adventuring activity that's, that's, very, that's very exciting um, and worth pursuing for, for, the, the, for the drama, for the risk, almost as much as the material rewards. And sometimes it's seen as something very boring and, uh, and emasculating. And I think it's, it's probably good for a commercial republic like ours when commerce is seen as something exciting, where you can go to take risks and find recognition. It causes problems when it seems boring and emasculating because then people start looking for more direct and physical and violent forms of, of conflict to replace the relatively contained um, competition, um, competition of, of, of business. Um, Professor Mansfield has used a phrase, certainly in, in his lectures, maybe also in writing, that I've, I've never forgotten, I think, um, in connection with, with Locke. He can correct me if I get this wrong, but he says something like, um, uh, Locke uh, 
modifies Hobbes by trying to replace the mortal danger of the state of nature with the bloodless killing of commerce. And the phrase, the bloodless <laughs> killing of commerce, has remained with me for 20 years. Um, and I, 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 and as, as I say, um, I think it's, it's good for us when commerce provides an outlet for manly energy and self-assertion and competition, because when it doesn't, that doesn't disappear. Um, and then perhaps we return to something that looks more like uh, the state of war. Um, yeah, I'd like to jump in. I'm, I'm by no means an expert on manliness. Um, but um, I think um, liberalism can very easily be scoffed at and rejected as, as weak. And I think um, that has mistakes. Um, going back to the Declaration of Independence, for example, they, the, 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 the um, colonists stood up for their rights, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Um, and how did they end the Declaration? We mutually pledge, pledge our lives and our sacred honor. Um, and Hitler um, obviously uh, defined his movement against liberalism, the contention, the weakness of liberalism, and also about the communists. And um, he, he wasn't worried about the United States. He said, they're liberals, they're not going to fight. And so I'm somewhat dubious that we have to have an aggressively martial ethos to have a strong, resilient nation and also military. Um, um, because Hitler was, was very much wrong on that. And in a way, I think both the, the framer, the, the, the signers of the Declaration, as well, um, as the, the, the liberals in the United States who fought against Hitler, in a way, um, were the descendants of Montesqu Montesquieu's depiction of the English regime. I mean, that, that he depicts the English regime as absolutely engaged in commerce. And he says, actually, their fo foreign policy um, follows their, their commercial interests. But he praises uh, the English for their sort of um, restlessness that they, uh, although they're engaged in commerce, they don't lose sight of what's going on in the political realm. They have a degree of vigilance. And he says, in, 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 in pursuit of their liberty, they impose greater imposts and harshness on themselves than any despot. Um, so I remain um, optimistic about the resources, um, spiritual, um, and, and the strength um, that is found in liberalism. Yes, I have my doubts about so-called common good conservatism or national conservatism, which um, um, I appreciate that the, the question's being raised. and. Um, I understand, I think, um, the, the f feelings uh, which um, almost uh, approach desperation uh, behind uh, a common good uh, conservatism. Let me uh, make a distinction between liberalism of the 17th century, which I think includes conservatism, and the liberals as we understand them to be today, who are opposed to the conservatives. Now, to take uh, a big example of politics today, the abortion issue, you can see that one side speaks for the right to choose and the other for the right to life. But both sides speak in terms of rights. And that's liberalism in the generic sense of the 17th century. You can still have an argument within the notion of society based on rights. And it doesn't necessarily have to lead to the conclusion that present day liberals 
have brought it to in their case. So the common good conservatives want to throw over the generic liberalism and not just the liberals who have understood Locke, say, Locke to be woke. <laughs> so, no. Um, I, and, and I have my, my doubts about doing this. What are they going to do, these common good conservatives, uh, if, when they get into power, are they going to uh, allow an election that would take them possibly out of power? Uh, elections are based on the right to vote, which is based on the right to consent. That's generic liberalism. <clears throat> if you're going to live under an election system, you have to admit that the other side may win now and again. And in the last half century, or maybe even a little longer, we've seen that each side has won about half the time. You have to get used to that and um, accept it, play your side, but understand that there are people uh, on the other side who still belong to your society. So I, 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 Yuval Levin has made, a, I think, a very good remark about liberals and conservatives. They're both, uh, they both think that they're losing. So the, the conservatives think they're losing on cultural issues, and they forget that they're winning on economic issues. And the liberals think that they're losing on economic issues and forget that they're winning on cultural issues. And that's because each side wants more than the issue that it's losing on. So that heightens our um, partisanship. And it's, I think, one reason why both sides treat each coming election as a, as a matter of desperation. But the, the, the conservatives shouldn't be so desperate. We're just, we've just won a big issue on, in abortion. I mean, the Supreme Court has established the point of view that I think most conservatives hold, that it should be uh, decided. It's not so much that it's absolutely against abortion, but that it should be decided democratically through the states. And the same thing may happen to affirmative action, which I'm very much looking forward to you, to it, let me tell you, in a university. Because that's become a, a, a terrible burden. And there I am, definitely. <laughs> not, well, not quite desperate, but uh, decided in my uh, animus against uh, that immoral and really um, impolitic way of uh, admitting and hiring and promoting people. Is that a system of racial preferences? Let's get rid of that. But to do that, we don't need to get rid of liberalism. So we have time for a couple of questions from the audience, and I believe we have a microphone uh, that is roving, yes? Oh, we have a microphone stand or roving? Roving, okay, good. Uh, we will call on Michael Maybach first. Well, what I was gonna ask is, you mentioned Montesquieu, checks and balances, <clears throat> spirit of the laws, 1748. How much did he draw from Aristotle's politics on the mixed regime? Was was that a source of insight for him, or did he have a very different view than Aristotle on that issue, please? Uh, the question is, uh, what about um, Aristotle's politics in relation to the separation of powers? Uh, yes, uh, you could say Montesquieu drew on uh, Aristotle's politics, but uh, he uh, modified Aristotle's politics and perhaps even transformed it. Aristotle speaks of a mixed regime, which is a mix of claims of justice on the part of parties. Um, there is a democratic party and an oligarchical party in most every society, he thinks. And 
And the best way to manage that is uh, a mixed regime that gives something to each side. But uh, Montesquieu did not want to base his, pol his political science on justice or on differing diverse claims of justice. He wanted to, to, base, wanted to base it simply on power. So um, he simplified these claims of justice and turned them into claims to power. And the separation of powers is therefore not so much a separation of principles, see, as a, a separation of the power to do things or to do something. And uh, the three kinds of power, legislative, executive, and judicial. So that's what I would, that's what I would say. So I apologize for the uh, confusion about the microphone. It is indeed standing, so please do line up if you have a question, and we'll come to uh, the next question. Thank you very much for this wonderful discussion, philosophical approaches to, uh, to politics and uh, culture. I'm, I'm a molecular biologist, immunologist, and I don't know whether I belong here, but we will see, we have seen in the last six or seven decades, telling the truth, even in the molecular biology or molecular medicine has become, has, uh, has heavy lace of politics that it's keeping our nation, America, uh, so sick, particularly with regard to recent event in the last two years. And I was wondering uh, whether we can, we can move toward uh, not misinformation, not deception to get where we want, but to tell the truth at any cost. Uh, this is a very long issue, but uh, you know, I just stop here. Someone wonder. What are well, the question's about uh, molecular biology and uh, you know, sort of public health. Maybe I'll, I'll put it this way. Public health is a question that gets re relegated to experts. And we are told that uh, what the experts say is something about which we may not have opinions and uh, we must simply trust them as if this is a matter of determinism. It's a question of science and therefore uh, individual will and individual opinion are not uh, matters here. And this of course speaks to the larger question of the authority of science within our society and whether authority of science has replaced not just uh, the one alone, the tyrannical or despotic figure, but whether uh, the power of science has in fact uh, made humanity itself obsolete, that it's simply a matter now of following whatever the science tells us. That in fact, it's even entirely impersonalized and that scientists are now uh, in some ways the new ruling class. And I'd be curious to, to hear you know, what responses our panelists have to that thought. You want to? Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> I'm not sure if this quite answers, but seems connected in some way. I mean, I, I, I think um, we seem to suffer from a deep fear of disagreement and what trust the, you know, the mantra, trust, trust the science does is relieve us of the burden of disagreement, including disagreements about the, the relative costs and benefits um, of, different, um, of different policies. Um, so if, I, you know, I don't know if, if scientists are, are the new, the new, the new form of tyranny, you know, the replacement for, for um, uno solo. I, I think scientists have received some of this authority almost by, by default through, through the abdication um, of, of public officials who don't want to make decisions for themselves and don't want to be held responsible for those decisions. Um, and that might be an area um, where 
manliness or the, the hope for recognition becomes important. What, what our, our, our system is built on the premise that people will want to put themselves forward and claim authority and submit themselves to public, to public judgment. Um, but the, the current class of politicians seems remarkably unwilling to do that. And then they defer to the scientists to provide answers or make decisions that they, they, don't, they don't want to um, face the risk of making for themselves. Yeah, the authority of science might seem to be uh, a good thing for liberalism because it provides um, answers to questions which otherwise might be uh, partisan. So it has, from that point of view, a, a dampening of effect on partisanship and therefore promotes uh, limited government. Limited government is government that doesn't have to answer every question or take a position on every, every question. We could let science go on its own. But when science goes on its own, it um, works for itself. It makes an authority unto itself. And, uh, and that doesn't have any necessary relationship to uh, human goods. A scientist could have a scientific reason for wanting a nuclear war, because you might learn something uh, about nuclear physics in that way. So, uh, so what makes for scientific progress and, and, and scientists were, were pushing thing, okay, is not necessarily in the interest of human beings or of a free society. And then, and then there's another point too, that science, especially modern science, is extremely expensive. It can't fund itself. It needs money from uh, the rest of us, the rest of us taxpayers from the state. And so it needs, therefore, publicists. A scientist, qua scientist, is not necessarily a good speaker or a convincing person. So you need somebody who is a publicist of science, a spokesman for it, who simplifies scientific questions so in such a way that we can understand and therefore see the reason for and therefore support science. But this, the publicists are uh, stepping into politics. Example, Dr. Fauci. So a, a scientific figure, just because he's trying to do what he thinks is the right thing, convince people to do the right thing, um, can get himself in a political position where he's disputed and where our hyperpartisanship goes to the extent that we, you can tell a liberal by his wearing a mask and a conservative by not. That's quite a thing, quite a state we're in. But uh, so science isn't the sort of answer to all our problems that we would like. So there, we need to have a kind of an, under, an understanding which includes science and is not necessarily uh, subordinate to it. Okay, well, next question. Uh, Terry Quist, uh, intelligence officer, um, adjunct in intelligence studies at Georgetown and uh, student of Professor Mansfield. I, I was emboldened by your discourse on effectuale to ask a question that I've long thought about, which is lo stato and its use in Machiavelli. Um, I don't speak Italian, but you can't get by scholarly footnotes without seeing discussions of lo stato. And in my struggles with it, the closest I came to, the, uh, to uh, uh, good understanding of the word was the notion of consequence, so that uh, one could be the head of st the state but have no consequence. One could be outside the state, like Machiavelli, for example, and have great consequence. 
And so I'm wondering, first of all, whether you, you agree with my appreciation to some degree, and also whether Montesquieu might have been accepting this approach to the importance of consequence, but simply defining new modes, methods, and orders appropriate to populous modern European states as opposed to the 16th century Florentine city-state. Well, <laughs> so uh, Machiavelli did not make a great thing of lo stato, of the state. Uh, to him, a state was always a personal domain. Uh, it had belonged to some particular human being or group of human beings. So when he said the Florentines have a state, that meant it had people over which it had power. Not just Florentines, but it happened to have <laughs> colonies or p p power in, in uh, Pisa and Pistoia, neighboring cities. But uh, the word state, as we use it, is impersonal. So that the, um, and this came about not in Machiavelli, but right after, in the phrase reason of state. And in the, the thinkers, the so-called reason of state thinkers, the state became something impersonal, so that um, the state could be guilty of Machiavellianism and commit dirty tricks and use fraud, saying. But private persons couldn't. Well, to Machiavelli, I think this would be a, a distinction <laughs> without a difference, <laughs> uh, as um, you still need to use fraud in order to capture the state. But in, in Louis XIV's famous phrase, l'état c'est moi, the state, that's me. <laughs> See, there, there he's using the impersonal meaning of state. I'm, the impersonal state is me, the person. So that's, it sounds like it's Machiavelli, but it, it comes after Machiavelli because Machiavelli would say, if you're king, of course you're the state. Thank you. If, if I, I may add just some, some additional random thoughts. You mentioned um, the, the state building um, in the, the modern era. Um, I think it's important to recognize that Montesquieu articulates his separation of powers with respect to monarchy, um, particularly, obviously, um, the, 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 the English Constitution. Um, but he thought the absolute watershed in politics occurred with the, uh, the invasion of Rome by the barbarian tribes, which like uh, Machiavelli, he often refers to as, as the French. And what they introduced is representative government. And he says the ancients had no notion of a monarchy formed on the basis of representation. Um, and I think that also, in a way, goes back to, to uh, what Montesquieu has to say about Aristotle. Um, in some ways, um, he is re respectful, and I think uh, bringing back an Aristotelian sense, particularly when um, he talks about the middle way, um, that the mean can be a type of virtue, and I think that, again, that's a response to Machiavelli, who said, go to the extremes explicitly. Um, but he is actually quite contemptuous, Montesquieu, that is, is quite contemptuous of Aristotle. He didn't understand the principle of, of monarchy. He didn't understand representation, and he didn't understand mar monarchy because he associated it with the virtue of uh, the prince or the king. Um, and um, that's a, a, a misunderstanding. It's a dangerous misunderstanding because we need that sort of separation of powers and the legislative power um, in, in representation. Um, and then, um, you know, Professor Mansfield just mentioned uh, Louis Cator's. Um, I see Montesquieu, again, is something of a radical. He's often associated, you know, because he was a, 
uh, a baron himself with the nobility um, and a supporter of the French monarchy, but he can be a very trenchant criticism of sort of the despotism, I think, of, of Louis XIV. Um, and in the, his chapter on corruption of a monarchy, um, he says, you know, what does a despot do? He removes, um, he makes the country his court and then the court himself. He becomes the state. And there, I think, um, if you read it in the French, he's clearly referring to uh, Louis XIV's statement, you know, l'état c'est moi. So I think for, for Montesquieu, that type of authoritarian um, monarchy was very much akin um, to, to despotism, and he looks to England um, and representation in a way that, that, that is a challenge to, to Aristotle. So we are almost at time, but we will take uh, one final question here, and then uh, if there are any parting remarks you'd like to make uh, as part of your response to the question, uh, we will uh, you know, consider that the last word. So go ahead. Well, first of all, thank you very much for a wonderful discussion. Um, my question is about rights and rights thinking and separation of powers. It seems if separation of powers has as its goal the checking of power, it seems almost a synonym of deadlock. And it takes away the, the purpose and the goal and the benefits of having power. Rights thinking, likewise, as an individual right, a claim against the state that has the appearance of an absolute claim, which also diffuses power. So each individual has his claim, absolute claim, against the state. Um, I don't see that as stemming from Machiavelli. Um, so I'd just like your discussion. Great, well, let's begin with uh, Sam Goldman and go down the line. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I agree that the idea of rights in that sense does not appear in, in Machiavelli. Um, and that's one of the reasons that I hesitate slightly about the, the description of, of Machiavelli as a, uh, the founder of modernity and the sort of forerunner of, of liberalism, because there are other and different and sometimes opposed ideas that have become um, quite quite important. I mean, I, I think um, in trying to understand Machiavelli's significance, the, the comparison that he himself uses is probably the most helpful. And I mentioned this uh, at the beginning. He compares himself to to an explorer. Um, so what, what does that mean? Well, first of all, um, it, it, it suggests that the effect is not exactly the same as the intention. I mean, famously, Columbus did not think he was going to North, North America. Uh, he thought he was going uh, to, to, the, uh, to the Indies, to Asia. Um, but that's, that's where he ended up. So I, I don't think it's required that we assume that Machiavelli knew exactly where he was, where he was going. Also, the, the explorer doesn't stay and live in the place that he discovers. He, he goes there and comes back and brings back the news and the knowledge that others then use to go and live there. And of course, this is part of the debate about Columbus, um, since his connection um, to what would become the United States is rather, um, is rather tenuous. And finally, the, the explorer may open up a new vista or possibility, but he doesn't invent it. The Americas were, were there. Um, Columbus and other explorers ran into them and explained, uh, and explained where they were. Um, and in thinking about Machiavelli's significance, again, th that seems to me um, the, the, the right metaphor, um, or to put it you know, in, in a slightly different way, um, it's, it's, it's Machiavelli's world, but we're the ones living in it. Um, 
I, I would suggest that, um, particularly from the standpoint of Montesquieu, deadlock um, <clears throat> is not such a bad thing. Um, because he was particularly concerned with power, um, a particular type of power. Um, he actually defines liberty um, as the feeling of security. And I think he saw that type of security being most threatened when one cannot criticize, um, stand up to a power in the state. He considered that treason. He used the term treason. Um, and he shows powerfully how charges of treason or less majesté, the lessening of majesty, or even lessening of the divine power um, is an extremely um, encompassing charge. It's an arbitrary charge, and it conflicts with the security of the individual. Montesquieu was certainly aware of rights. Um, he writes after Locke. He writes, obviously, after, after Hobbes. He pays glancing attention to the state of nature. Um, um, at the beginning of the spirit of the laws, but it comes for, forward again. He says human beings have the right to preserve themselves, um, which is, in a way, echoes um, Locke's notion of, of self-ownership. So again, I think um, Montesquieu's major concern is the power of the government to act quickly, decisively against individuals. Um, I would say that uh, the Machiavellian aspect of right is um, in his notion of animo or animus and, or virtue, virtu, of standing up and not taking things, um, not assuming that you are going to be secure without any action on your part. So, and I think that's part of the notion of right that you have to claim a right, and as, you, as we say, stand up for your rights. Or we have politicians who stand up for us. They claim to fight for our rights, by which they mean argue or contend. So, so it's, it's that element of uh, contention. And, and what, what's different is that right has a sense of justice infused in it. Whereas uh, Machiavelli says that's, that doesn't matter, that's irrelevant. And as to de deadlock too, I think uh, uh, that can be rephrased or restated as deliberation. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we sometimes take a while to decide things, and maybe that's good. If it's an emergency, we have uh, an executive to deal with that. But if it's a policy that we can consider over time, um, maybe it's not so bad that we can't do it right away. One of the bad features of hyperpartisanship is this alternation of one party and another. Um, one comes in and tries to undo, undo everything that the other attempted. Um, instead of uh, listening to its own rhetoric, instead of looking at the situation, wondering whether, for example, as in healthcare, we haven't ended up with something that, though expensive and irrational, does uh, make a majority happy. So a kind of plea for deliberation and also for compromise. And on that note, I will just say that the conversation will continue in the pages of Modern Age and in future events by Collegiate Studies Institute. Thank you all for coming this afternoon, and uh, join me in thanking our panelists.